Hey, business aficionados. Welcome to episode 57 of A Shot of Business Central and a Beer. I'm Michael, your business buddy, and right beside me is the man with the mic and mission, the author of a real gem, Ken. Cheers, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here as always, ready for a chat, maybe to share a beer nugget or two. Oh, today's show is hotter than a summer barbecue, from the juiciest Business Central news to riding the AI roller coaster. We've got it all. But here's the kicker. Today, the spotlight is on Ken. Ken, our business central savant, has not only been our guiding light, but has also dipped his toes into the world of publishing. Yes, indeed. We're going to explore the ins and outs of his masterpiece, The Executive Guide to Implementing Accounting Software. So brace yourselves for wisdom tales and maybe a dash of Ken's humor. Well, Michael, you know, they say a good story always has a twist. And today, it's the twist of me doing my best to be both host and guest. So grab your drinks, get comfy, and join us for an episode that not only educates, but brings you closer to Business Central Nirvana. Episode 57 of A Shot of Business Central and a Beer, where every sip is a step into the lively dance of business is now. Let's go! All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 57. Uh, we've got a uh, lot, lot in store for you today. Uh, glad to be here with you today, Michael. Glad to be with you as well. So I, I went ahead and I, I picked up uh, some new beer. I was um, looking for the right beer for today and leaning towards something traditional and you mentioned that you might want you want something different crazier the better crazier the better that's exactly what i think you said <laughs> so what we're drinking today is donna's pickle beer and you know what i just popped it open i gave it a little smell and this might sound crazy but it reminds me of a baseball game, like a hot dog with pickles at a baseball game for some reason. Maybe because we talked about stats and baseball you earlier. Eat the two together. You have yeah. you, eat, you eat the hot dog and then take a sip of beer. Yeah. So yeah. your brain's kind of putting those two things together. Yeah, but I definitely smell pickles. Definitely pickle flavor. Um, it, I read there's pickle juice in it. It's not just like flavoring. It's pickle juice oh, really? and beer in there. I'm going to give it a quick um, sip. You know, we unfortunately we don't have a lot of reviews, a lot of detailed information about it. Um, but yeah, so the only background we really have is that, and here's what it says on the on the can. It says, Donna was backstage at the garden eating pickles from a jar. In a flash of light, she was pushed on stage and kissed full on the mouth by a beer drinking Mick Jagger. It was electric. No, not the kiss. Poor Mick. The taste in her mouth was electric <laughs> with the beer and the pickles. So that night, Donna's pickle beer was born. Yep. 4.4% ABV. Yeah. Um, looks kind of just like a regular lager, pilsner in, in color, like a light, light yellow, typical type, you know, yeah. um, lager type head on it. I'll, I'll give Donna credit. This is one of the beers where it actually says it's a pickle beer and you can actually taste the pickle in it, right? Yeah. A lot of the beers say whatever it is, coffee and pineapple, and you never, you get very subtle, subtle notes of that. But this one, you taste the pickle juice. Yep. Yeah. Um, I did, I did see a thing. It says Donna's finest homemade brine with big, bright herbal and floral notes is integrated beautifully with an all American lager and accentuated by Saz. And Hallerto Middle Fro hops. You'll relish every sip. It's got to be the sauce, Hallertone, and Middle Tone frops. <laughs> yes. Or just the pickle juice. Yeah. But you also mentioned earlier that it's interesting where it's produced out of Chicago, right? It's made in Chicago. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's made at a, at a place called the Pilot Project Brewery. And I had not heard of this before. So I'm like, I checked it out. So what it is, it's a brewery incubator, tasting room and restaurant located in Chicago, Illinois, and also in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And it was launched as a collaborative place to help support brewers 
Um, modeled after the music industry, Pilot serves as a launch pad for startup breweries, offering assistance with recipe R&D, production scaling, marketing, distribution, and more. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. I just want to say that I think it's kind of funny that so Ken and I, we usually come in here and we're ready for the beer and we drink it. This time, though, we both brought water bottles just in case <laughs> the beer was going to be too much to handle. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. You know, we'll 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 uh, the, the the true test is will we crack another one? Yeah, open? yeah. Yeah, it, it, I mean, if it gets warm, it might scare me. We'll see. Yeah, All I right. think it's go. I think it's only to your point. I think it's only going to get more pickly the, longer, it, the yeah. longer we go here, the warmer it gets. All right. So coming up, then we're going to bring you the shot of business central. We get some business central news for you. I'm going to then interview Ken about his uh, book, The Executive Guide to Implementing Accounting Software: Over 100 Ways to Ensure the Success of Your Project. And then we'll do a little bit of AI snack time, but. Yeah. Most of it's going to be focused on Ken today, folks. All right. Woohoo. Ken, it's time for the shot of BC. And, uh, you know, we've got some news, but last month we didn't dive into the news too much because we had a special guest, Jim Geo, and we spent a lot of time. So we really didn't get a chance to talk about the minor update 23.2. And I know that you'd like to mention a couple of things about it. So the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, 23.2. Um, you know, it feels like for some reason to me, after just seeing all the the uh, updates coming out about environments being updated, that it's been over the course of several weeks that 23.2 is kind of being deployed across different environments. Um, but I think everyone should probably, most people have probably updated at least 23.2 as of today. Um, really is just one platform update, 45 application updates, some localization updates for several different regions, many different regions. But in particular, I noticed a lot for the Czech version for some reason. <laughs> Maybe they have some issues. And then also, I just want to point out there, there are feature changes that are being deployed as part of each of these minor updates. These were all updates that were included as part of 2024 three wave two and they're now being rolled out right over the over these minor releases however just so people aren't getting too upset i look through the list of what these particular new features are most of them are uh not things that most users need to be aware of really they're yeah. kind of the under the hood technical development service type things that yeah. don't affect everyday use so just some things that they basically needed to correct. Yeah. Well, then we have that in common with the uh, minor update 23.3, because a lot of that is also as well technical. Um, you know, I, I would mention that for some reason, the uh, e invoicing with NEM handle in Denmark isn't listed as a localization change. It was listed actually on the feature changes, and I'm not sure why. Yeah. So Microsoft, if you're listening. It's a little weird. Yep. Yeah. Let us know. But other than that, it's... Uh, Let's see if anything's notable. Maybe translatable Excel layouts. If you're into that, you can use the two dollar sign tags in Excel for worksheet names, chart yeah. headers. Pivot maybe elements. maybe there's someone out there that's been really looking forward to this new feature that allows you to make use of static and runtime metadata right. in Excel layouts. Right, 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 right. But other than that, it's very technical for everything else. So what we'll do is we'll put links to everything in the show notes in case you want to uh, read it and and catch up on it. And then uh, I'd like to mention one more quick thing coming up for Business Central before I pass it over here to Ken so we can go through his news. There is a virtual AI hackathon for all Business Central partners from February 20th to the 23rd. Um, so if you're in AI, you know, if you've, you you want to see, I think, I think what it is is it's people who have developed AI things for Business Central. They might be showcasing what they've done. So check it out. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. And Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. I'm not a developer, but I wouldn't mind seeing some some cool stuff yeah. maybe see what people are doing yeah hopefully it's not too technical but yeah we'll see um what do you got ken yeah just a, just a general kind of business central support type things that uh we we did uh notice that in version you know the latest release major release 23 that that there were 
several changes to the consolidations functionality. So if you if you're running multiple companies and you're consolidating your your financial data into a consolidation company, uh, just maybe you've already seen this or uh, but if not, be aware there are some just changes to how that how you click through that process uh, to get that done. Um, the only other thing was um, in I think it was version when version 23 originally came out. Um, there was uh, kind of some weird things happening with the search function on list pages where you type something in and the, kind of the results would be funky inflate like kind of change and act yeah, weird some sort of um, glitch yeah i think i think it's been resolved in one of the one of the either 23.2 or three um i think 22.2 uh kind of resolved that i haven't heard heard of any issues recently yeah neither have i so yeah i think it's been resolved yep um also i just want to kind of touch on um you know it's a january now people are st hopefully start planning on deciding whether or not they want to attend any user conferences uh, during 2024. Uh, the, the first big one uh, that's coming out in May, May 13th through the 16th, is Dynamics Con Live 2024 uh, in Denver, Colorado at the Denver Marriott Tech Center. Um, I just saw an update. They're expecting huge growth over last year's numbers, um, possibly over 2,000 attendees this year. That's a three-day multi-track event focused on GP, Power Platform, uh, and as well as Business Central, CE, and uh, Finance and Supply Chain. Um, I think that's I, huge growth, right? Because I think last year, maybe six or 700. Yeah, maybe, 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 yeah, maybe right. Do over doubling. Correct, yeah, definitely more than doubling. And I think it, I think it more than doubled the year before that. Gotcha. Um, this will be, this will be my, I am attending. It'll be my third one that I've gone to. Uh, the previous two have been very well done. Very nice conferences, well orchestrated yeah. uh, by the team that puts it on. I expect another good conference this year. Uh, and also, I am going to be leading two sessions, Business Central two. sessions. Um, one is called Feast on the Cornucopia of BC Reporting Options. Nice. So we're going to kind of going to just talk about all of the different ways that you can now pull data out of Business Central to manipulate it and do reporting, whatever you need to do, um, which it's, it's, we've come a long way <laughs> since the old days yeah. of NAV. So I'll just say that. Um, and then the second session that I'm leading is called Field Monitoring, the new and improved change log. Okay. So we're just gonna dive into kind of what is change log and then what is this new field monitoring feature, compare and contrast and explain, um, Kind of uh, what you can do with it and how, how it's, what it's designed for. Sounds like really good sessions. I'm sure that your sessions will be highly attended because they always are. So everybody listening, check it out. Ken puts on some great presentations. Try to have some fun. I'm not sure if I'm legally allowed to do so. Maybe we'll be handing out free beer samples. <laughs> legally allowed to do so. <laughs> yeah. You might be. Nice. Anything else? Yeah, yeah wait, just so for new? Business Central partners out there, um, you know, I think recently Microsoft announced that uh, they are going to create a new path for Business Central partners to become uh, to to achieve the Business Applications Solution Partner designation, which offers benefits to partners and shows their skill with implementing Business Central and supporting Business Central. Um, I just went out there, uh, went on to the skilling area and looked at the advanced certifications. There's, it's still not available as of this point. I'm not sure exactly when, maybe March or April yeah. is when this is supposed to come out. But basically what, what it's supposed to do is allow, uh, they're going to add a new advanced certification for Business Central Development, which that, that combined with the functional consultant Business Central certification that exists, you get a certain number of people with those, both of those, and then you achieve the advanced certification. So, are you sold on the the new certification? Um, new certifications, I guess the the way it is, or do you prefer the old way where it was gold, silver? Um, you know, I I think um, if they can, if they get a path for Business Central partners, keep it up, right? I've, I'm looking at everything through my Business Central glasses, yeah. so. Once there is a path for Business Central partners to achieve a partner solution designation, 
then I'll be a fan of it. As long as it doesn't involve enterprise. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> should I, do I do I have to pass some FNO exams to become a business central, right? To achieve a certification? It's not really fair. So not at all. I think once they fix that, I will be. Um, it is something that it is going to be much more closely monitored and there's calculations based on number of customers and growth and and things like I'd that. I'd be curious so. to talk to some customers to see what they actually think of it. If, it. if it's high on their priority list of when they're choosing a Microsoft partner. I don't know. My guess is that there may be some customers that look at that, but the vast majority have no idea. Right. It's just it's just a connection you build through the the process. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You meet some people at a at a partner. They seem like they know what they're saying. Yeah. You get comfortable. Yeah, I think they can help me. Right. It's probably the most part. Interesting. Yep. That's that's uh, that's it, huh? Yeah. All right. Well, we should take a couple more swings of this pineapple beer, and then uh, we'll jump into pickle uh, beer. Or yeah, what did I say? Pineapple. Pineapple. <laughs> pickle beer. And then we'll jump into interviewing Ken. So stick around, everybody. We are back for, well, I guess I will call it a special segment. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Executive Guide to Implementing Accounting Software. Over 100 Ways to Ensure the Success of Your Project book, which was written in 2007 by this guy that I know. <laughs> By Mr. Ken Sebahar. So, all right, Ken, today is your day. We uh, we want to talk about this book because Ken and I were, were were trying to figure out a way to start talking about implementation on the podcast. And you know, it's if you're not if you're not a business central kind of sewer or, or whatnot, right? If you talk about implementation, it it might I don't want to say bore you, but it might not hold your interest as well. So we're trying to figure out a way to to introduce implementation and Ken, you know, was talking about, oh, I wrote this book and I was like, oh yeah, I remember. So yeah. it's a great way to introduce implementation to everybody and, and a great way to break it into our, uh, our podcast. But, you know, Ken, tell us a little bit about who you are for the people who might know. I know a lot of people follow the podcast, but they might not know your background, how you got started. Sure. Um, you know, maybe even what led you to, to write this book. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for uh, giving us the giving us the opportunity to talk about this. It's uh, you know, I haven't really focused too much on this in in several years, right? Or talked about it much, uh, so it's this is fun. Um, so yeah, so I I you know I graduated. I have an accounting degree, accounting background. I went to go work uh, just almost just coincidentally at a company that developed and sold project accounting software. And I, I work. I was just doing accounting there. I was in the. I was the accounting manager, um, and so just doing your day-to-day -day accounting tasks. But the uniqueness was that I was using the software that they developed. So, and I was actually like the guinea pig, you know, the the alpha test site. So when they created a new version or a new feature, I would be the first person to use it in in the real world. And so I started working with the you know, developers and the some of the feature, you know, architects, software architects and stuff. Um, <clears throat> and long story short, after a little bit, after a little while, I started doing consulting because I knew the software. So I'm going out. I, I, I was started doing training um, and just helping support some of the end users on the software. And you know, flash forward. Eventually, I, I we hired a new accounting manager so that I could start doing implementation full time. After about 10 years of implementing ERP and accounting software, I realized that I, I like tried to figure out, right? It's, a, it's like the constant battle of figuring out what is it that makes some projects go so well. <laughs> And other projects don't, right? Is it is it that I decided to try on this project, <laughs> but I decided I don't really feel like trying on this other project, where one goes really well and one doesn't go well. Yeah. And and so it was a constant battle to try to figure out what is it that that make that gives what 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 is it that gives companies the greatest chances of success of implementing their software. 
So I just started writing down things in Excel and creating a list. And what I realized is that after a while that I had quite a few tips and tricks and things that that made made it uh, kind of told a story. Yeah. And the story that it told was that it really didn't have any, much to do with me as an implementer. Right. As a project right, manager right. and impl and a so software implementer, it had to do with the organization at which I was implementing the accounting software. Yeah. Right. It was it was less about me. It was more about them. And specifically, it was the company and the people at the company deciding that they they're taking ownership of the software that they just bought or now subscribe to, right? <laughs> um, but it's that they they said, hey, we're buying this new ERP software and it's our software. We are responsible for learning how it works, implementing it, training our users, and then running it and managing it over the long run. That was the differentiator. Yeah. And, and so that's, I think, what the overlying message is is that if you really want to be successful, you need to take ownership. This is your software. It's not the implementer software. It's not the company that developed it. It's not their software. Yeah. The, you know, they will help you, but you are responsible for owning it and and uh, and and getting the getting it done. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny actually. Funny that you mentioned that because throughout your book, you you mentioned numerous times that it's the 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 resellers or implementators' job to basically pass along knowledge to the customer um i was wondering if you, you know what what your experience has been in the past do you think customers agree with that or do, or do they most likely think hey especially before subscription i'm paying you however much money i want you to implement this software get it done and not you know give me knowledge about it it's your job to be knowledgeable has, has that been your experience with a lot of them in the past or well I, you mean like at a, I don't know on a percentage. What it what I've seen is that the ones that understand that are the ones that are going to be more successful. More successful, yeah. Right. And and here's the thing: if you look at like a look at like a, a an X and Y axis, right? So and you have um, you have the strength of the organization and their people on one axis and the strength of the implementer or implementation team mm -hmm. on the other axis. Obviously, if you have a strong organization and a strong implement implementer, you have a high degree of success, chance of success. If you have a poor organization and a poor implementer, you're gonna ha not have a great chance of success. But what's interesting, and this is kind of like how I vis would visualize it, if you have a strong organization, but a poor implementer, that organization still has a good degree of chance of success. So they got a shot. Versus the poor organization or weaker organization with a strong implementer. Yeah has a low chance of success. So right? what you're saying is, right, better to have a weak implement, implementator, implementer, implementer, thank you, <laughs> and a strong organization yes. willing to to oh, take ownership of it right. as opposed to a really good implementer and a weak organization doesn't take ownership. Correct, because that implementer is there on a temporary basis. Right. Right. They're there to help facilitate this implementation, give them support and guidance and training where they need it. And if they have if they're if they're strong enough organizationally and they have a good team in place, they'll be able to understand where the implementers maybe deficiencies are or they're not strong and overcome that somehow by bringing in someone else or or learning right. it and making and then being able in a position to make the decisions on their own yeah. instead of relying on the implementer but um but yeah so that i think they can overcome that and that's what leads me to that's what if you kind of put that picture together with these four quadrants it leads me to believe that it's really the strength of the organization 
their dedication to the project and ownership of the software, that is the most important factor. Gotcha. No, that makes a lot of sense. So, <clears throat> well, all right. So let's 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 dive in a little bit here into the book and and, and talk about some of the things that I I noticed. Yeah. One of my else. Yeah. So I mean, real quickly, just before like you mentioned, let's get into the sections of the book. So just real quickly, how how I decided to oh. to write this is it's not written in a traditional like book format, where, where pages and pages and pages of just text and text. Just completely cool. And I'll tell you why. I started writing a traditional book. I couldn't even read it myself. <laughs> it was so boring. And I, I, my, my, I believe that pe people generally they're too busy or they don't like to read. So, so to get through a 200, 300 page book on software implementation was just a non-starter. <laughs> and I'm like, so I'm like, I got to change this up. How can I change this up to make this so that people will look at it, they'll read it. So I created it in sections and those sections kind of follow the phases of a software implementation yep. from software evaluation, selecting modules, working with the software vendor, implementation planning, software design, training, data conversion and deployment. And then each topic is one sentence in bold, which summarizes the concept mm -hmm. and then a paragraph or two Talk maybe diving it. into a little bit more detail, but it's very high level. Let's call it executive guide yeah. because it's something that I don't know how long you read it years ago. Mm -hmm. How long, right? It's a few hours. Yeah, it's yeah, right. If you're taking a flight somewhere, read it on the plane. It's a, it's a right. couple hours long. Yeah, right. and that's that's by design. It's so that people won't have the excuse. Hey, I'm I am in this phase of my project. Oh, here's ten topics, ten things that I can do to be successful. Yeah, and I can look at it in about fifteen minutes. So. No, yeah, it's it's and you know what else is surprising to me about the book? Um, so I've actually read it twice now. I would say ninety percent of everything in this book from two thousand seven applies to it still applies to twenty twenty four. Yeah, maybe even more so. than ninety percent, ninety five percent of it. So, it's 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 stood up to the test of time, Ken. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right. So in the first section of the book, you know, you list some basic startup steps uh, when to, you know, to follow when you're evaluating the software. So you list the steps as basically defining the project vision, setting the budget, uh, you know, seeing some demonstrations and then, you know, asking the vendor for, for references. I'm curious now that it's been 17 years since you wrote the book, would you say those steps still apply would you like to add anything to those steps or would you like to take anything away from those those uh, evaluation steps yeah i think i think generally speaking the, it, the, those same steps apply right you have to have a vision for the project what are your primary goals do what's your budget is that budget realistic right those things are all there what's changed a little bit in the in in 15 years is the availability of online videos Right, demonstrating yeah. the functionality of different ERP solutions, uh, as well as even free trials, yeah. where you can you can set it up yourself and look at it and see how it works. I don't recommend that because you do need to be trained on how things work, especially if you're doing complex ERP with manufacturing, yeah. purchase planning, inventory, yeah. warehouse, uh, that type of stuff. So, um, you know, that's that's. So I, I think it's uh, pretty much the same. Um, now, so now, you know, 17 years ago, if somebody wanted to, obviously you could demo the software for them, but was there anything of like setting up a, a, a virtual sandbox on a server or something like that to let somebody get in and, and just I mean, mess around with it? I mean, you're able to put a, put, a, put a sandbox in somebody's server that... 15 years ago, that was the exception. So what that meant was, right, you, you, if it was a, you know, you could negotiate maybe and do like a install it and do a free 90 day trial of some gotcha. sort or whatever. But that was the exception. In the old world, you had you had a buyer, someone who's evaluating ERP systems had to come up with this long 300 yeah. list, you know, long uh, task list long of requirements. And they had to go through those one by one and make sure that the new software could accomplish that because they were expected to hand over a check for fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars. And once that check clears, 
right? Yeah, they're, they want it all. They're stuck with that software. So there was huge risk. So you, they really had to vet the software and the implementer really well. Today with subscription, you're with Business Central. Let's focus on Business Central, please. <laughs> you're committing to like $70 for one month for a subscription yeah. to get started. Now, it might you might decide to go longer than that, maybe add a couple more users and actually start the implementation and actually see those key things working with your data as you've set up your customers and items and, and so on. So there's that risk is completely gone away. Right. There's there's very little to no risk yeah. now with getting your making sure that from a high level this software is going to meet your needs and then dive deep as as you kick off the implementation set some milestones to make decision points of how are things going are we still on track is this still the software for us yeah. right so you mentioned back then people would create a list of whatever 100 200 300 features that they want yeah. um in your book you know you talk about listing no more than 10 essential must haves and then having a secondary wish list of things that you'd like, but are really, really not too essential for, for what you're doing. Right. So my question is, you know, ERP has come a long way since 2007. I'm sure people still have must-haves that they want, but are they really still creating these lists or are they assuming that because ERP is so, so advanced that every feature they have is automatically included within, within the ERP? Yes, they are assuming that. Gotcha. And they are now coming in with much shorter lists, generally speaking. Um, that's not the best approach because every ERP doesn't do everything. Right. So that's that there's an issue there. But but yeah, generally speaking, most companies we see come in and they're like, here is our pain point. Right. We 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 do we we do we're a distributor and we have a huge volume of EDI. And today our software doesn't support EDI. We need it to be fully integrated within our system. And, and that's a key requirement, you know? Gotcha. And then some of the little things like how a credit hold gets handled. Yeah. How do I have access to the visibility of my on-hand inventory? Those things become less important than those, those major requirements, you know, core. Do you think we're moving towards where you know, it almost seems like, right? I mean, there was big distinguishing factors, let's say 17 years ago when you wrote this book, probably in 2007, between your top five ERP softwares. But I think as, in my opinion, as we're moving more and more down the line, everything seems to be encompassing more and more features. Do you think in 10 years, you're going to be able to distinguish between softwares or are they going to all have the same capabilities and you're just going to buy whichever one you like? Well, I think we're already like even in the Microsoft ecosphere, we're getting the the finance and supply chain, or AX, F&O, I don't know, whatever they call that product <laughs> now, right? Dynamics 365, that product and Business Central are, are moving closer and yeah. closer together, right? Business Central scaling up higher and higher. They're adding more and more features and integration with all the other Office and Microsoft yeah. products. AI. So just in the, in the Microsoft world, those are becoming a little bit indistinguishable to a certain degree, look and feel. Yeah. Um, there's still going to be differences out there. Um, so yeah, it's hard to say, but I, I think... I think a lot of the base software is going to be close to the same. Yeah. Atlanta, but I think all the extensions and apps that you can add on, that I think that's where the... The uh, ecosystem, correct, yeah, if the you ecosystem, will. Yeah. yeah. All right. So <clears throat> I found this interesting. This might be one of the biggest differences. In your book, you mentioned the one-to-one uh, -one ratio. And for people usually in the business, they understand that, you know, for every dollar spent on software licensing, you're going to effectively, you would have had to have spent the same thing on uh, support and licensing maintenance, whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, but now with the subscription model, is there still a one-to-one -one ratio or is there something else or is that just um, be out of the window. Yeah, officially, no, there's not a one-to-one -one ratio because if I, you know, if I have, let's say I have a 10 user uh, Business Central premium license, $100 per license, yeah. that's $1,000 a month. 
Well, it's going to cost a lot more in implementation <laughs> and consulting services than a thousand dollars to get that up and running. Yeah. Right. So, so how can you? So one way that you you can attempt to still come up with this, and this is by the way just a general rule of thumb, this one to one ratio. That's for simple financials, kind of basic right, distribution. Right. If you get into manufacturing or service or other things, it could get up to size four to one in terms of implementation services to licensing cost. Um, but you can still do this rule of thumb if you take your monthly subscription, multiply that by 24 or two years. So in my example, we had 10 users for, uh, right, $100, so $1,000 a month. So $24,000 is in terms of licensing subscription. So plan on at least $24,000 of implementation expenses associated with your, so having a consultant help you with understanding how should the system be set up and configured, converting your data, helping you cut over and go live and, and support your users, training, right? Yeah. Um, so that's that's still kind of a, that's a way to, that's a way that you can translate the old upfront licensing into a subscription. No, that makes sense. It's it's definitely hard to put a ratio on subscription based. <clears throat> All right, let's see what else I got here for you. So, yeah, you you throughout your entire book, you seem to allude to a lot to three years, right? Three years for financing, three years for investment summary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, my question to you is, do you still think companies should look at things through a three year window, or is that number decreased to maybe two years, like you were mentioning with the yep the the ratio, or or should it be more? I would say actually it's irrelevant. Not, <laughs> yeah. Knock on your book. <laughs> yeah. Cross out that page. Um, yeah, I would say it's actually uh, less relevant. And and the, the the reason a three year term uh, is is kind of what I use is because that's kind of the typical upgrade cycle, both in terms of hardware, new servers. Yeah. There's a lot of people have three year leases on equipment, um, or that's how often a company may upgrade from their current version to the next version. So if you think about it, you're going to have to, if you buy the software, implement it today and get it up and running in about three years, you're going to potentially need to think about investing in an upgrade project and new hardware yeah. or new licensing or whatever it might be. Now with the cloud hosted solutions, that <laughs> cycle is gone. Absolutely. Right. You're, it's monthly. You're every month. Uh, Microsoft is, let's again, let's stick with Business Central. They're updating Business Central once a month. You're staying current. There is no upgrade cycle. Yeah. You're just continuously on the latest and greatest version. Uh, and there's no hardware. Right. Would, would 2007 Ken believe that in 2024 or 2023 and 2024 that the upgrade cycle would be completely gone and there's no more hardware? Or would, or would 2000 of Ken, 2007 Ken yeah. would have said, no, it's impossible. Uh, no way. No, I think so. Yeah. I, th I think I think I would have because uh, I mean, like QuickBooks online yeah. has been around for a while. Now, granted, it's pretty basic functionality, yeah. um, but th they managed to do it. So I think it was just a matter of larger organizations being comfortable with the uh, consistency and availability, right? Yeah. Of having that system hosted somewhere else. Yeah. I think a lot has got to have the internet provider. Internet connectivity, internet speed. Yeah. Right. And and just cloud hosting and Microsoft. All of that's evolved significantly. 15 years ago, like I, I personally at, at a mid-sized company that does manufacturing, I would not have been comfortable relying on my ERP sitting no, yeah. somewhere on a server outside my building. Right. I think 2007 was, was that the year the iPhone was released? iPhone one, maybe. So yeah, yeah. but but now nowadays, yeah. I I mean, it was you know, it's been a long time coming. ERP has actually been one of the one of the slowest adopters of cloud technology. If you look at all the different types of oh. apps that have been available on on cloud as cloud apps. Oh yeah. ERP and in midsize organizations has been. I think it's a lot of complexity, you know, right. what, what it takes to run run the ERP online. Yeah. All right, let's get back to the number three. 
this question to me is kind of interesting. You talk, uh, you know, about contacting a minimum of three references supplied by the vendor. So the question is, do you still believe this is important? And I, well, first, let me tell you, I've never understood the concept mm -hmm. of me giving references to somebody. You want me to waste my time contacting three people you handpicked for me to talk to. But that's a high level overview, so to speak, right? If it's ERP, yeah. I guess you could dive in more about <clears throat> processes and how you use things and whatnot. Right. No, listen, I, I, I agree with you. In general, references are not nearly as valuable as people believe they are. Because to your point, they've handpicked who they're going to let you talk to, right? Um, well, with that said, like, so business central, right? Um, if, if I'm buying business, if I'm going to be buying business central and implementing it, I'm much less concerned about the reference check in terms of, hey, does this software work? Exactly. Right? Because it's globally used, it's been deployed for years and years. Right, it comes from a reputable company. <laughs> millions of people using yeah. it, right? So I'm I'm less concerned about that. But but this book was not written only for Business Central, right? It yeah. could be that that someone's looking at an ERP solution written by some company out in you know, Bufu right, right, whatever right, right. location, yeah. and the, and the, and they have very few customers, right. and it doesn't work really well, but they think it might, right? So that case, you want to vet, does the software work for you, blah, 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 what issues do you have? But the other type of reference would be on the implementer. Like if you're looking if you're looking for references to say, I want to, I want to talk about the implementation. How was this, how was the implementation team? Did they give you help? Did they support you? Were yeah. they available for you? Uh, did they, if you had any customizations, did they give you multiple design options? Yeah. That type of thing is what you're vetting more is the, is the team. Right. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's move down to, uh, or move up or down, whatever you want to call it, to the module section. So uh, in this section, it was interesting to see that you chose to talk about document-related modules for ERP within the module section. Uh, specifically, you mentioned document formatting and document imaging solutions. And as I was reading this, I was curious to know if you were to rewrite this book today, would would document modules make the cut? Is uh, that something everybody just believes is, I don't know, standard and everybody knows how to... Like document management? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Probably more so. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, everyone wants document management to be integrated with the ERP so I can I can pull up a customer's contract from a customer record or see a signed delivery authorization on a sales shipment right and those those documents linking and tying documents together scanning in documents to auto attach them to the the appropriate record in the system so do people automatically assume though that that is just there and easy to use and and uh, or, or is it no, something? No, I don't think people assume it's there. No. They'll ask, yeah. like, "Oh, do you have? Is there built-in document management options?" And of course, you know, with Business Central, there are document attachments mm -hmm. uh, that are there and links that you can add. But there are also a number of apps, right, out there yeah. that Most do a really thousand. good job with this for for some of the advanced functionality, yeah. OCR and whatnot. All right. Speaking of modules. Um, in 2007, it seems that a modules and for ERP was more like a la carte. You got to pick specifically everything mm -hmm. that you wanted. Today, where it's more the out of the box functionality, it's 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 pretty much all included. Um, was it easier to implement it when they were separate modules in the past, or is it easier now? Because I'm thinking my reasoning is maybe in the past you can pick and choose what you want, whereas today, you know, it has everything. And customers like I want this now, do this. It has this. Why can't we do that? From an implementation standpoint, yeah. today it's significantly easier. Really? Because generally, you know that all of the features and functionality are available, right? With Business Central, you have Essentials and Premium. Mm -hmm. Premium just adds the manufacturing and service management modules. Um, but from in the old world, it could be like, well, are you implementing, do you have access to the warehouse features? Do you have right, access to the right. CRM functionality? And as an implementer, you had to constantly be aware of what did this customer purchase? Do yeah. they even have access to this? If someone mentions they'd like to use it, 
now you generally know that everything is there available for the most part with those with the premium exceptions. Understood, yeah. understood. In this in this section, you also mentioned that if a company has under 100 employees, they should outsource payroll. Mm. Do you think that holds true today? Or is that not, would you change that number? Um, I would say I would change it. Yeah, higher or lower? Always outsource payroll. <laughs> always. <laughs> um, and, you know, and again, for, on, from a business central standpoint, small to mid-sized yeah. organizations, there's so much complexity involved with payroll and all of the filing requirements and withholding rules. You've got garnishments, um, all of this stuff. Like, it's so hard to keep track of everything and keep current on everything and update withholding rates and things like so that. So you basically need an internal team if... Yeah, if you want to do payroll in-house. So from yes. a cost-benefit standpoint, a liability standpoint, even a data security standpoint, um, I think it makes sense to outsource. Do you really want all of your payroll data sitting inside your business central environment where you have maybe 50 users from the warehouse to right. sales to purchasing in there? Yeah. That can potentially, if there's a, a mishap with permissions, somehow some data gets exposed. Yeah. yeah. So if, there's a lot of reasons why I'm, I'm a fan of outsourcing payroll. Uh, there are some apps for business central. But yeah, generally speaking, I would say always outsource payroll <laughs> unless you're an enterprise a huge enterprise company with yeah. a huge payroll department right, right? yeah and it make, might make no sense. it makes sense um all right i want to talk a little bit about the uh working with the software vendor section and uh this th this this kind of struck me as is interesting you mentioned the importance of uh over communicating right so can you talk a little bit about this uh, i tend to think as time goes on people want to communicate less and less, especially in today's world, mm -hmm. or if they do want to communicate, it's it's through a means of like email or something, no face-to-face no -face or phone or whatnot. Do you think over communicating is still important? Would you recommend it or, or what? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. this is, um, and what you say is true. People do, are interested in direct communication less and less. Send me an email, send me a text, yeah. right? I don't want to meet face-to-face -face right. or even virtually face-to-face. -face. Um, however, an ERP implementation project is a significant undertaking with literally thousands or maybe tens of thousands of decisions that have to be made. And it is critical that everyone communicate well and stay on the same page. Um, to make sure that you have a, a successful project. So everybody communicate, the more the barrier. <laughs> All right, let's jump to uh, some implementation planning. I know that we're going pretty long here. So uh, you mentioned that if a vendor is assisting with the implementation, you should require that that vendor demonstrate to you a proven implementation method. Oh my God, <laughs> methodology. Let's just say it that way, okay? <laughs> methodology, yeah. let's put it. Uh, so my question to you is, what do you mean by implementation uh, method? Oh my God. Methodology. Thank you, methodology. And what should be included within one? Yeah. So, I mean, simply put, <laughs> what you're asking, and when imp big words, right? Implementation methodology. Yeah, Sasko Patelian. What you're, simply put, what you're asking is, how are you guys gonna get to help us get this project done? Right. Right? So what are the key tasks that have to be done, the steps, the order of those steps that those should be done optimally, um, the milestones, key, right? Check-in points to see, are we on track or not? Um, how are they gonna cut over the data from the old system to the new system? Um, and then how are they gonna train your users? How are they gonna, are they, how are they gonna be available for support over the first few weeks of go after you go live? Yeah. Um, all of that is the methodology and it's the approach they take. Um, I would tell you like what, you know, a common approach we take is crawl, walk, run. Everyone Makes kind sense. of understands that, yeah. right? Let's not overbuild to start. We want to get you in the system, using the system as, as is, if possible. Now, it may not be possible, so we may have to do some customizations or add some apps or whatever it is. 
but but still the 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 mindset is we're not going to get everything done but we want to get you in there learning the system using it to get some return on your investment mm-hmm. and also so because then you become a stronger user and you're in a better position to understand what you may need or not need. Maybe something you thought was really important once you start using it, you're like, oh, you know what? We really don't even need that anymore. So that's that's a methodology. Yeah. Uh, so just a couple of follow-up questions. Should that be something that's documented and given to a customer or is that just something that you guys talk about uh, with the implementation team and the customer? Yeah, no, there's there, there should be some Form of documentation. Formal uh, documentation, okay. diagrams, uh, high-level documents that explain, at least at a high level, the key steps and right phases that you're going to go through. So you said walk, or you said, I'm sorry, you said crawl, walk, run. I'm curious to know if back in 2007, that was kind of the same thing, same approach taken maybe with um, different phases of an implementation. Maybe phase one was the crawl, the mm-hmm. crawl phase, as opposed to um, with the key user trainings. I mean, is that same approach? Same crawl, approach. Run, run. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. That hasn't really changed. And, and really what, what's, you know, when you say crawl, walk, run in an ERP system, right? There's, there's especially business central, you have all of these integrated modules. It becomes very difficult to do like, let's only do financials first and then we'll do inventory and then we'll do manufacturing. Right. That becomes different, difficult. So you're better off getting all of the system deployed. So from a horizontal perspective, but know that all those bells and whistles that you want to be there aren't going to be there on day one. Maybe you're going to have to enter some things manually that will eventually be automated. Right. Maybe you're going to have to run this report three times instead of one time because that custom version of that report hasn't been developed yet. So those are some of the things that we're saying is, is get in there, start using it broadly. Yeah. But then know that we're going to add some features, functionality, apps, customizations down the road over time to to improve, continue to improve the efficiency. So in your book, you mentioned that it usually takes four to six months to implement uh, yep. accounting slash ERP software in 2007. Is that uh, about the same for today? Is it sped up or is it slowed down? Generally speaking, same. About the same. Um, you know, you can see quicker, um, but some take longer. But generally the same. The only the only real difference is the first phase of the project, which is getting the software initially installed and configured. That can be done much quicker, much more quickly, right? A couple yeah. of days instead of a couple of weeks or even longer, typically, because you don't have to order a server, yeah. wait for the server <laughs> right, right. to get here, install the software, deploy it, install the client everywhere and get everything hooked up. So, um, but but beyond getting the software installed and configured that first phase is much faster now after that similar nice nice all right let's move to the software design section um you wrote the only time a modification to the new software is warranted during the implementation project is when the standard software prevents you from completing a required task this guideline is critical to managing the implementation budget and timeline in cases when you cannot complete a key task without modification, attempt to use a temporary workaround to accomplish the task until users can become more familiar with the software. My question is that given the different levels of modifications with ERP, do you still agree with your sentence in cases when you cannot complete a key task without modification, attempt to use a temporary workaround to accomplish the task until users can become more familiar with the software. Yes, and even more so. Even more so. Now, the good news is that overall, users seem to be much more willing to use the system as is versus 15 years ago. Um, maybe it's due to the fact that it's like a cloud-based app. They're, they're uh, better familiarity with technology or maybe due to previous ex- negative experiences where they were had to work in a heavily customized mm-hmm. solution that no one knew how it worked, right? Um, but but yeah, and I, I would say that that's the good news is we're seeing less and less customization requests. Yeah, is it easier to customize ERP? Let's just say Business Central today as opposed to NAV in two thousand seven. Absolutely, 
Sure, because and now it's, ex it's extensions, right? So you can install an extension and you can just as easily uninstall an extension, right? So uh, in the old so days- then you, So you still stand by the sentence? You use know. it as is, yeah. Even if it takes you a couple extra clicks, yeah, absolutely. And here's well, why. I think I'm more so with use a temporary workaround. Do you think it's more beneficial to waste time on a workaround or to install? The In the short term, it's worth it. Yeah, for sure. That gets into the overbuilding thing. <clears throat> you sure. cannot expect on day one it's going to have everything you need for the next ten years or twenty years, right? It's it's crawl walk run it's let's <laughs> use it you may find that that workaround isn't really that hard and because you have other time freed up because other things are easier now doing that it takes you the same amount of time but it's gotcha. not a problem anymore gotcha gotcha mm -hmm. all right all right so i guess my 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 final question to you would be um if you looking back on this book is there something you wish you would have added to it? Or if you were to rewrite it, is there something you'd like to change off the top of your head? I mean, is there anything that you thought maybe you left out of the book when you wrote it? It's an excellent question. And you got to um, circle back. I'm going to circle <laughs> back on that. Right. Um, no, I, I, I actually, what I'm planning on doing per an idea that I got from a, a great guy I know is to take this content and actually republish it on Speaking Business Central. Nice. So that will provide me with an opportunity to review each one of these hundred tips and tricks um, and evaluate, does that still make sense? What should I change or what's not in here that I should add? So we can look forward to a volume two. You got it, right? Every every 16 years, whether it needs it or not. All right. Well, Ken, I appreciate you taking the time to answer some of my my boring questions. I know we spent a lot of time on it. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, it's really beneficial to the people listening. And you know, we're oh also, where can they find your book if they want to buy it? Amazon. It's on Amazon. So it's called the Executive Guide to Implementing Accounting Software. Over 100 ways to ensure the success of your project by Ken E. Sebahar. Yep. And if I, uh, you know, maybe I'll get enough, uh, you know, to go out to uh, pick up a pizza and a couple <laughs> beers. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you what, sounds like a good uh, session to be uh, to be had at one of these community events. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Next up, we got uh, AI snack time talking about a little bit of the latest uh, AI news. So talk to everybody then. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell you, Michael, after that great discussion about implementing accounting software, I'm ready for a snack <laughs> and to talk some AI. So we got some dots pretzels here, the old the old go to the old go to snack go -to, here. Yeah, um, just so darn tasty. Um, so we're going to enjoy some pretzels and some beer and uh, talk a little bit of AI. So what do you got in the news? All today. right. So what I got, well, let's see. So popular news, I know what you're going to talk about. So OpenAI, which is funded by Microsoft, and I don't even know, it might be owned by Microsoft, maybe not owned by Microsoft, but funded yeah, by. It's like a weird. Yeah, so, but they have relationship, a relationship, whatever. There. Yeah. They launched a GPT store for custom AI assistance. So this is where people are creating AI assistance for things like personal trail recommendations from all trails, searching academic papers with uh, consensus. And it's 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 really cool. You So you go on there and it's all these things everybody's created. And, it, you know, if you had the idea, somebody might have had the idea to create an AI bot that'll search, I don't know, Michael Jordan's stats from where he shot on the floor in 92, 93 for something. I don't know. But you can, uh, you know, link with these, 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 store products and, 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 you know, have some fun, I guess. All right. I came across a genius AI product as well. It is the world's first smart basketball hoop by hoop H U U P E. <laughs> uh, we talked about this earlier. So it's basically uh, the backboard for the, the, the basketball net is a smart screen. 
right? And you can track your basketball data, like field goals made, percentages, whatever it may be. On the backboard, you can have a coach do a virtual basketball workout with you to where they're watching you shoot and, and, and whatnot. Um, they also have virtual workout programs, worldwide competitions. You can play games with your friends. So, you know, you shoot like horse, then it, it, it links with the other person's smart board. And it also it uses AI to analyze and, and, and track your shots. So, you know, if, if you're really into basketball for AI, it's a, uh, Pretty cool. I mean, I know I don't I don't look like it, but I played basketball pretty much like every day in my life, among other sports. So when I was younger, I would have loved it. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at some pictures right now online, and it's basically like picture a rectangular, you know, bas backboard. Yeah. With a giant uh, flat screen TV built into it. Right. Yeah. And when you're not using the flat screen or whatever, you can change it to have the backboard uh, square outline and everything. So. It's different. Yeah, it's just, it looks like, like you said, there's, I see uh, some pictures where it looks like there's like a, maybe an instructor yeah. offering lessons. Yeah, analyzing um, your shot or whatever. Yeah, as, as you're going through. I don't know if it's live or if it's like a video, but maybe you can sign up for like video training we, classes or something live, and yeah. it'll show you some techniques and things like that. So, yeah, that's my, that's my genus AI product of the month. And then uh, for Microsoft, there wasn't really too much new news. I mean, I know that uh, for uh, Business Central, Copilot chat is is soon to be released, hopefully within the next month or two. Everybody keeps talking about it. Um, but I think Kenny has some some Microsoft news for, for AI. Yeah, just, uh, you know, one announcement uh, is that, uh, you know, Microsoft has been in talking about Copilot Right, announcements about Copilot for this and for that. Um, and what they just announced was that Copilot is now generally available um, for Microsoft 365 through the cloud solution, through cloud solution providers or partners. Um, and the biggest thing is that is they've taken away their there was kind of like a preview they were doing um, or it was only available for organizations or minimum of 300 users. Yeah. And they've kind of removed that minimum seat purchase. So now anyone that has e Office, Office 365 E3 or E5 can now purchase Copilot for Microsoft 365. Very nice. So speaking along that, on January 15th, Microsoft also announced the availability of Copilot Pro, which so this is separate from Office 365 to where you can just buy Copilot by itself. Um, but it's going to give you access to Word, PowerPoint and, 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 and all those type of things. But what's unique about this is it's going to have the ability to build your own Copilot GPT, a customized Copilot tailored for a specific topic. And you can do this in Microsoft's new Copilot GPT Builder that is uh, coming soon. And they claim that you'd be able to do this with just a simple set of prompts. Um, for a normal guy like me, I don't know. Let's hope so, right? I can get in or maybe try it out. But I, I remember the days when they said that uh, uh, Power Apps was pretty simple and anybody could build, <laughs> you know, apps really easy for whatever. So we'll see. I think our definitions are different on, on what's easy and what's not. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So I think uh, I think it's time to rate the beer, Ken. I think so. <clears throat> Want me to go first? Yeah, go for it. All right. So I want to first start off by saying this beer was exactly what it it it's supposed to be. It is a pickle beer. The pickle flavor is there. Um, it's 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 pretty smooth. It has good carbonation, good color. Uh, you know. I think what it really comes down to is whether or not you can handle that much pickle with what you're drinking. Like I, like I was telling you, if you're one of these people where supposedly the day after you have a hangover, you drink pickle juice and you're fine, fine, you can handle it. Me, I can't drink a bunch of pickle juice. So when this is cold and compared to when it was warm, it's, I don't want to say night and day, but you know maybe morning and dusk. <laughs> you know what I mean? But one one can is all I'm going with. I'm not going to have more than one. So I'm going to give it a healthy rating of 42. 
42 out yeah. of 100. Yeah. Not to knock the company, though, right? Because it is exactly what it is. It's not like, you yeah. know, you're, you're drinking a knockoff of Miller Lite or whatever, and it tastes, tastes yeah. shitty, you know, or tastes bad. Sorry. <laughs> it's your but, personal beer. Yeah. Your right. Personal exactly. beer rating. Yeah. But yeah. what about you, Ken? Well, <laughs> I, uh, I'm right. I'm right with you. Right. It was I, I everything you said. Right. It's a it's a pickle beer. It's great. It's this except for one thing. It's pickle beer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I, you said 42. I say 41. Okay, nice. Perfect. Not because I want to go one lower than you. I, I had 41 already written down, but that's, that's, th- I, word, that's, pretty, that's pretty much the closest I think we've ever been. I don't yeah. think, I don't know that we've ever had the same exact rating. No. Well, we were both able to finish it and I don't think either one of us wanted to crack open another one. Correct. <laughs> so, all right, everybody. We appreciate you listening. Uh, Tune in next month. We'll be back. So also share the podcast with everybody and look forward to the show notes. Ken, take us home. Bye. Bye. As we end today's podcast, we want to give a big thank you to everyone who listens, shares this podcast, and leaves us reviews. You've taken a good amount of your time out of your day, and we truly appreciate it. Thanks again. And uh, don't be afraid to email us at marketing at solsyst.com with your tips for the podcast, or maybe you'd even like to be a guest during an episode.